Okay, so last time we talked, about, we went over, did an overview of excavation support, right? Hope we did. That's what I remember, but it was a long time ago, it seems like. Um, and so today we're going to talk about um, how to calculate earth pressures. Uh, my goal is to go through the um, apparent earth pressure diagrams today. Um, the, and I'm, I'm going to go back to the original um, research where, the, where these were generated from. They're, they're really easy to use once, once we generate them, but I want to talk about where they came from because I think it's really important for you to understand that. Uh, and then I think the best use of our time then after we do that is we'll start looking at your first, the, the design problem for this, that's due this next week and um, go through the, um, how to generate the earth pressure diagrams for that. So we'll, we'll take some time, uh, this, we'll take some time in the second half to work on that. Uh, and you'll just get started with that. And I gave you a problem that's actually fairly complicated to do, uh, so it'll be good for us to start it now. Okay. So um, I would like to point out that what we're talking about here in this um, um, is, uh, I'd like to point out that the title of this is Apparent Earth Pressure. Uh, uh, and apparent earth pressures in excavation support, and that term apparent earth pressures is going to be really important. So, um, when we finish this block, you should be able to explain why we're, uh, why the classical earth pressures don't apply and why we're using these uh, apparent earth pressure diagrams, and then describe the concept of where they come from uh, and, and contrast that with the actual earth pressures that are going to be behind the walls. We're going to go through uh, Peck's 1969 paper uh, in detail because that's where these were originally generated. They essentially haven't changed since then, so I think it's pretty important for us to uh, make sure we know where they came from. Um, and did I assign? Did I post? I didn't post it up for a reading, did I? For the did I uh, for a uh, review? Did I on uh, the the Peck paper? Yes, no. Okay. Um, and then, um, every, for the most part, everybody uses PECS earth pressure diagrams as if they're like the cat's meow and they're the only way to do this and they came down from heaven from PECS. Uh, and I'd like to point out that there's some other earth, apparent earth pressure diagrams to use, in particular those by Chebateryov. Uh, Chebateryov was a uh, kind of the black sheep of the early, uh, he was one of the, uh, he's a contemporary of Richard Sagi and Peck, and one of the early uh, uh, soil mechanics guys, he was kind of blackballed by the rest of the team, and, and, and uh, so unless you went to uh, Princeton, I don't think you probably don't know anything about Chebateryov's work, uh, and so I think he did some good work. I don't think Tertsagi and Peck are the only people in the world, so we're going to talk some about um, Chebateryov's work and compare it to Peck's, because it's probably just as good. Uh, and then, obviously, the, the final uh, goal here is that you should be able to apply those to design of walls, which is what's in your, pro your, uh, your design project for this, or your design problem for this set. So let's talk about how earth pressures uh, actually get generated when we're doing stage construction, because as we talked about, uh, last time, whenever we're doing this excavation support, it's always done in stages. So, um, this is going to be our, our wall element here, and we're going to excavate in this area over here. So, obviously, um, if we excavated down uh, and just let the wall move, we'd, we'd uh, reach the active earth pressure. And uh, if we pushed really hard on the wall, we'd reach the passive earth pressure, so we must be someplace in between, or maybe not, as we find out. So when we do our first stage of excavation here, when we excavate down to this, to this first level here, uh, we should be following the active earth pressure envelope because the wall is going to bend in, there's no support, and we should get to the active earth pressure. But then we're going to install a strut. And we're not just going to drop the strut in there and hope that it eventually picks up the load. We're going to drop that strut in and we're going to jack it in. We're going to pre-stress the strut, they, they, they call it. It's not really pre-stressing because it happens after we excavate. But we're going to put some, uh, some load in that strut. So when we put some load in that strut, we're going to increase the earth pressure. 
and uh, theoretically the maximum it can go out is to the passive earth pressure. And at the top, that the difference between the active and the passive is not going to be that great, and we could easily jack, the, jack that first one in and get out here to the passive earth pressure. Then obviously as we get down below the strut, it's got to drop down someplace um, near the, near the um, active earth pressure, at, well, at, at least at the lowest of the active earth pressure. So then we're going uh, we're gonna to excavate down to our next level. And again, the wall is going to be, down here is going to be allowed to, to move. Now, it, it could get as low as the active earth pressure. It might be someplace between the active and the passive earth pressure. Then we're going to install our second strut. And we're, of course, we're going to pre-stress that strut. So now we're going to have some earth pressure that's, again, it's going to be higher by the strut. Um, and then decrease some to some level below that. Uh, again, it should always be someplace between the active and the passive envelopes here. And then we're going to excavate down again, uh, put in our third strut, and again we'll get another distribution of earth pressure like uh, something like that. Um, so the actual earth pressure we're going to get uh, acting on the wall is going to depend upon a lot of things. It's going to depend on the depth of each excavation stage, because as we as we excavate down, we're going to we're going to be we're, we're going to be relieving more and more stress. So if we excavate deeper before we put the struts in, we're going to have a different stress to start on before we put the strut loads in. Uh, it's going to it's going to depend on how uh, how hard we jack how high the jacking pressure is in the struts. They call it the, the they call it the pre-stress level. It's not really a pre-stress, it's sort of a post-stress. But obviously if we jack really, really hard on it, on every level, we could get out to the passive earth pressure. It's probably not something we want to do because we, really we don't really need to get that high. But, but the level of pre-stress is going to be really important. It's going to depend on how stiff our wall is. If we have a stiffer wall, the distribution of earth pressure between struts is going to be more uniform. If we have a very flexible wall, it'll be less uniform. And it obviously will depend on the soil stiffness. Uh, this is uh, uh, the soil stiffer. Uh, we're going to distribute the loads more. If the soil is less stiff, they're going to be more concentrated around the struts. And the truth is, this is a soil structure interaction problem. So the only way we can really know what the earth pressures are behind the wall, well, the only way we can even really estimate them, is if we use a complete model for both the wall and the soil. So we need, a, we need a model for the wall that has the stiffness of the wall in it. We need a model for the soil that has the stress strain properties of the soil and the failure criteria for the soil. And then we could, we could model this and get an estimate of what the earth pressures really are. So, so that's, that's a big problem um, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of uncertainty in doing those models. Um, and as a, as a matter of um, um, simple routine, it's a pretty expensive analysis to do, uh, and it's not commonly done. And particularly, you know, back in the 1940s and 50s when this work was done, those capabilities weren't even there. So a, a completely different approach was taken to determine these um, earth pressures behind the wall. In fact, the uh, empirical approach was to not really even determine the earth pressures. But the approach is this. Uh, measuring strut loads is, is, is relatively easy. That's, you just got to put a strain gauge on. The, the struts are almost always metal. You put a strain gauge on the struts. You can measure the loads in the struts relatively easily. Um, that, 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 that was easily done even back in the, in the uh, <clears throat> 1940s. So we can measure the struts and the loads. Well, then we know, we know the net result of the earth pressure behind the wall because we know the loads in the struts. And then if we assume we know the tributary area for each strut, then we can back calculate the average uh, earth pressure uh, at each level uh, because we know the strut loads and we're assuming we know the tributary area. Now this tributary area may not exactly be divided halfway between each strut. That will actually depend on the stiffness of the soil and the stiffness of the, of the wall, but that's the, the general assumption. So we could generate a, 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 an earth pressure like that. And then um, we can compare it to the active earth pressure uh, 
which is a theoretical calculation we can do. Um, and then we have at least some basis to compare what is our, our, our earth pressures from this loaded wall system to what, what we would get from active. Uh, this will re obviously require that we know the soil strength parameters. We have, to do, we have to know that in order to calculate the active earth pressure. But it doesn't require, for example, knowing any, it doesn't require knowing the stress strain property of the soil out here or its failure criteria. Well, we need, a, we need to know its strength properties, we don't, but we don't need to know the stress strain properties. We don't need to know the modulus. We don't need to know the stiffness. We're just going to back calculate them. The, uh, the, uh, uh, this is where we get the name apparent earth pressure diagram. We're going to back calculate the, what's the apparent earth pressure diagram knowing the strut loads. So, um, and then the, the approach that was taken uh, and, is, and is documented in Peck's paper is then to, for a whole bunch of different uh, excavations, we're going to plot these apparent earth pressure diagrams and see what they look like. And then we're going to pick an envelope that surrounds those diagrams and use that for design such that there's a pretty good chance that the loads that we'll actually see are going to be less than or equal to the loads we're designing for based on similar excavations and similar materials. So it's a complete empirical approach to design. So let's look at, so this, this is how that process works. So let's look at the data uh, um, that were used to develop these. For excavations in sands, um, um, the data is based um, mainly on excavations in uh, New York, Berlin, and Munich. And these data come from the 30s and the 40s. <clears throat> and there's a reference there in Terzaghi and Peck that you can use. And this is what typical. This this is the. These are typical data that that uh, as they were, as they would have, as they have been published. So you generally know the uh, you'll, you'll you'll know the uh, geometry of the excavation, uh, and you'll know where where the struts were placed. You don't necessarily know what the ex what the construction sequence is. You don't necessarily know how deep they went down in to um, uh, before they place the struts. You just know where the struts were placed. And then um, you'll have these apparent earth pressure diagrams. Um, and, and so these are, you can tell, you can tell these are back calculated because, because these are sim simply block functions based on uh, the strut loads. So you can tell that these are block functions based on strut loads. So this is a, these are data from a particular excavation, and these would have been different struts at different locations and excavations. These are long excavations for subways. So in the same stratum, these are measurements at different locations along the length of the excavation. So same pattern, same strut, uh, same strut location, same typical construction techniques, but you don't know what the guys did uh, on a certain day. Could have been on Monday they were hung over and the excavation wasn't done so well. Uh, and so you end up with a, a bunch of measurements like this of the strut loads as a function of depth. And let's just take a minute to look at those. And, and, and uh, So th now these were excavations in sand now, remember? So what do you, what's the first thing that you notice about those back calculated earth pressure diagrams, particularly as we think about classical earth pressure theory? If we were designing this wall, you, you, guys, just, you guys just finished your um, MSC wall design. If you're doing your MSC wall design, what would your earth pressure diagram behind the wall look like for a sand? Be triangular, right? Be zero at the top and it increases. So do these look like they're increasing versus depth? I mean, that's the very first thing you notice. They, they, they don't even appear to be increasing versus depth. And this NA value. Um, um, if you take the height of the centroid of the pressure diagram, that's HF. So that's the height that you can calculate the centroid of the pressure diagram. And if you just take HF over H, that's the, that's, that's the height of the, the, uh, the net resultant force. And notice in these that, um, where's the net resultant force acting? Yeah, basically right in the middle, right? It's halfway, the, it's halfway up the height. 
So that doesn't look anything like a classic earth pressure diagram. Why aren't we getting classic earth pressure diagrams? Well, this has nothing to do with active or passive conditions. This is neither one. We're putting these struts in. You know, we're excavating down to some level. We're putting a strut in. We're putting some load in this strut based on some experience of the c contractor building it. And then excavating down some more, putting another strut and putting loaders. This, this has nothing to do with active and passive pressure. Um, the other thing this doesn't tell you is the time. No, notice these have not, nothing to do with time. So these are the maximum strut loads that would have been me measured over the, the duration that the excavation was open, because the, the, the strut loads are not going to be constant versus time. Obviously, this, when, when you first, if your first level of excavation is only down to here, and you pre-stress your strut load up to some level, as you excavate deeper, that, that, that load's going to increase. So these are the maximum strut loads that were measured during the course of excavation. And it may not even occur at the same time. So for instance, the strut load that gave this peak load may have, may have occurred at a different time than the strut load that gave that peak load and the strut load that gave that peak load. So they're not even, th these are not even necessarily loads taken at the same time. They're just the maximum strut loads that were seen at each level and then um, back calculated into an earth pressure diagram. And they're clearly not classical, and they shouldn't be. We shouldn't expect them to be. OK, well, let's compare them to the active earth pressure. So that's the next thing that Peck did. So he just plotted, here's the, the measured strut loads uh, on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, these are the strut loads you would compute if you had a classical uh, active earth pressure and Rankine theory was used. Okay, and uh, we've got uh, three different soils in here. Uh, one is from New York, got a friction angle of 35 degrees, and you've got uh, two in Germany with friction angles about 40 degrees. And what do we see? So a line of one to one. This line here is one one on one, right? So this is the line where the the, the measured strut loads. Ooh, that wasn't so good. The measured strut loads are would be equal to um, the um, strut loads you would get if you had active earth pressure. And what do we see? What do you see? It's pretty simple. Sometimes there. Sometimes they're higher and sometimes they're lower. Doesn't seem a lot of lot rhyme or reason to it, does it? OK. So let's look at the distribution of the actual uh, apparent earth pressure diagram. So this is um, the, the apparent earth pressure diagram compared to the active earth pressure. In other words, uh, 1 is 1 times Ka gamma h. OK, that's right. And, and, and 0 0.5 is half Ka gamma H. Um, these are the same data that Olson uh, put together uh, um, with even more data. Um, and, and the way Olson presented it as R, which is R is just the ratio of the apparent uh, to the active ranking pressure. And this is as a function of depth. So there's something very, very interesting in this plot. That's the most interesting thing you see in these data. Nothing interesting at all, huh? That yeah, it should, shouldn't it? Did any of these earth pressures get up to one? That's the most interesting thing in this. The apparent earth pressures compared to the rank and active pressure are always what? Always less than the active earth pressure. Always. Now remember, these are back calculated based on strut loads. That's all we're doing. 
And these were, by the way, these were pretty flexible walls. I think in all cases, these were sheet pile walls, uh, I think, for the sands. I'm not positive about that. Maybe I better not say that, because I don't really know. So from this, uh, Terzaghi developed what he called, or what he proposed, as, and these words are very important, apparent, okay, apparent earth pressure. And there's two words here. The, 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 there's the two most important words in this, in this title are apparent and envelopes. Okay? They're called apparent because how were they how did we calculate how were the earth pressures that were used to, to generate these envelopes calculated? We just went through that. How how were they how did how were the earth pressures estimated? Well, from strut loads that we then assumed we knew the tributary area and then calculated an earth pressure. Right? So they're not really the earth pressure. There's some apparent earth pressure based on a strut load measurement. We don't have any measurements of the earth pressure. Okay? And we don't, and we don't have a nice, it's not like we put an instrumented wall in and we measured the deflection of the wall. I mean, we, we looked at that one um, um, cantilevered wall that had a lot of instrumentation, you know, and they, met, they put, put strain gauges on all the rebars and you could calculate the moment in the wall pretty well. And from the moment in the wall, you could back calculate the earth pressure. And it's nothing like that. We got a couple points. You know, we got four or five points going down the length of the wall, and we're measuring strut loads. So that's why it's apparent. It's not a real earth pressure. It's an apparent earth pressure diagram. And then it's not even a, he doesn't even call it an earth pressure diagram. He calls it an earth pressure envelope. And what's an envelope? What do we do with an envelope? We use envelopes to do what? What do we use an envelope for? Just forget this. I, I hand you an envelope, right? I, I should have brought an envelope. I hand you an envelope. What, you know, what, what, what do we use envelopes for? To put stuff in. They hold things, right? Envelopes are for holding things. They're for containing things. So this is an envelope that contains most of the apparent earth pressures derived from measured strut loads. This is not a prediction of the earth pressures behind the wall. That's not what it came from. It's not its intent. We'll, we'll, and so I'm going to hit this. I hit this theme already once. This is the second time. So we're going to hit about three more times during this presentation. It's probably the most important thing for you to get out this presentation because these things are misused all the time. Okay. So this is an and and apparent earth pressure envelope. And this is the envelope that's, that uh, Tersagi and Peck in 1967, and it really hasn't changed much, uh, recommended to use uh, when designing walls. And they're basically saying that they said the R is 0 0.65. So what are they saying? Yeah, that, that if you assume that the earth pressure behind your wall is two-thirds of the active earth pressure and constant with depth, that you can use that to design your struts. That's what they're really saying. We'll get to, we'll get to that last comment. We'll, we'll discuss that last comment I made in more depth in just a minute. Okay. Um, Olson took the data they had and plotted um, plotted in a, in a, as, as a normal distribution, which is a real handy thing to do. All right, so this is R. This comes from the same data we just saw. Uh, here, the, these come from these data right here. And, and this is nice. He plotted as a as a, as a um, uh, normal distribution to fit a normal distribution curve to it. So this is the freak, this is the the uh, um, distribution function. This is a cumulative distribution function. And there is 0 0.65. So and I didn't go back and uh, compute that, but that looks like it's about um, well, about two sigma out from the mean. So two sigma out from the means of, is that a 95% or 90? I can't remember. I should have looked that up before I came. 
So this, so, you, so uh, if you use this data, you could calculate a probability of exceeding those earth pressures. Because remember, this is just based on a whole bunch of data collected. Or maybe we shouldn't say. I guess it's a whole bunch of data if you if you think that this represents a whole bunch of data. Okay, those are the data that were used to generate this. So if you think that's a whole bunch of data, then it's a whole bunch of data. Okay, so let's look at earth pressure diagrams for other materials. So that was for sand materials, sandy materials. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. So Chevateryov did the same exercise, and this is his uh, uh, earth pressure diagram. Now he doesn't use a he doesn't use a a constant earth pressure diagram because we know the earth pressure we know the apparent earth pressure has to be zero at the uh, ground surface. And we know that uh, at, at the bottom of the excavation, if our wall goes below the bottom of the excavation, if there's no displacement at the bottom of the excavation, there shouldn't be any earth pressure there. So um, Chebateryov's earth pressure diagram actually is, makes more logical sense than uh, Tertagi and Peck's, but whether it's, um, whether it's uh, equally complicated, uh, whether, whether the additional complication is worth it, uh, we'll have to, I'll leave to you to decide. Um, but he, he formulated it a little differently. He just, he, he just took it as 0 0.2 times gamma h in, in the center part. And he's got these, these sections at the top and the bottom where it, where it tapers off. So we've got a, um, um, he didn't compare it to the active earth pressure. So we need to do a little, we need to do a little uh, math here to compare it to Tutsagi's and Peck's. So, um, if we set 0 0.2 gamma h equal to r times k a gamma h, uh, then um, in uh, Chebateryov's formulation, r is just equal to 0 0.2 over k a. So we need to make some assumption about what k a is. So uh, what we can do is, uh, since we have uh, um, average friction angles for each of the cases that Peck used, we can look at them each separately. Um, so in the case of New York City, where we had a uh, phi of 35 degrees, Ka is uh, tan of um, tan squared of 45 minus 35 over 2, or 0 0.27. Um, so R over uh, uh, R for this one is 0 0.75, right? And what what is Tsutsugi and Peck remembering, uh, recommending? Yeah, 0.65, right? Um, so for Berlin, so that if the or if you want to plot that backwards into the the, the um, um, earth pressure diagram, this is the Peck diagram for uh, New York. The white blocks the Peck diagram for New York compared to Chebateryov's diagram. And for Berlin, where uh, phi was 40 degrees, we can back calculate uh, that um, R was 0.95. So if we plot that, um, or, or if you want to back calculate, if you want to plot that on um, Chebateryov's diagram, that's this, this, um, this line right here. So that's how, so that's, look, using the data that were used to generate Peck's diagram, that's how uh, Chebateryov's diagram differs from Peck's diagram. So is one of those better than the other? I, I don't know, and I would leave it up to you. So in some, in some senses, Chebateryov's is simpler because you don't have to go calculate the active earth pressure, um, but it's a little more complicated and includes this other piece of the diagram. Um, so um, what can we conclude from looking at cuts in sand? Well, the apparent earth pressure diagram is not constant with depth, but the centroid appears to act at about the middle of the, of the cut, right? It's definitely not constant. We go back and look at these. It's definitely not constant, right? This is, th these are clearly not constant with depth. This one looks like, kind of like it's increasing with depth. This one, something's happening here, and it gets really high here. Maybe they just jacked that particular strut up a bunch that day. We don't know. Um, this is definitely not constant. So it's definitely not constant for, with depth, but it's also pretty clear when you average it out. Um, 
It's also pretty clear when you average it out that the centroid of that area acts pretty close to the middle. Over that was those are you know that we only I only showed four of those diagrams, but there's quite a difference in the distribution of those, and the centroid was very very consistent. Um, it's very clear that the that the earth pressure diagram drops near the sif, near the surface, and, and to a lesser degree it drops near the near the base. Let's go back and look at that again. So, it, you know, the drop near the base is less. Here we see a significant drop near the base. This one's significant near the base. This one much less so. This one doesn't appear to have a drop near the base. Um, there's clearly a significant variability in the, in the earth pressures you get. Um, even for um, relatively uniform soils. Uh, and that's probably due to the construction methods. As, as, as we just pointed out, one of those strut loads was really, really high. Well, I don't know, maybe the guy wasn't paying attention to how high he jacked it the day when he put it in. Or, you know, maybe something happened outside the excavation. Maybe the ones that are low, there was a bunch of ground loss into the excavation and unloaded the struts. We, we, we don't know. Uh, this is a soil structure interaction problem, and, and you've got to actually do that problem if you want to know what's going on. Um, so those are my conclusions from the from the data for cuts and sands. So let's 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 now go look at yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's a great that, that's a great point. Is that. We don't have any information about the, the deformation load curves on these. And in order to use that, in, in, order, in order for that information to be valuable, that you, you have to then have a, you, you have to have the stiffness of the wall. That's relatively easy to model, right? We're just gonna use steel, that's relatively easy. But you also have to have a stress strain uh, um, model for the soil. Hopefully next week we're gonna spend some time just getting slightly into doing numerical calculations and we'll, and we'll look at different um, parameters for soils. The big problem is getting a good model for the soil because it doesn't do you any good to, um, um, it, it's of no value to, to know the deformations if you don't know the, prop, the, the deformation properties of the soil. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean that's the, the, the quote right way to do it. The trouble, the trouble, the, the problem with doing that way is that actually doing the calculations is very complicated, and you can get a bad, like any finite element an answer, you can get a really bad answer because you did the finite element problem wrong. It has nothing to do, you know. So your finite element problem is a bad model for the field. Then all this extra information you gathered by doing this fancy model is worthless because you have a bad model. That's a big problem with uh, finite element models. Okay, so let's talk about cuts in clay soils. So for cuts in clay soils, the, the field data indicated that the strut loads uh, were really uh, highly dependent on the stability number. Now this should make sense, because last time we talked about um, basal stability and movement of the walls, and we were looking at displacements, and we found out that the displacements of walls in clay soils, particularly soft clays, was a function of the stability numbers. The stability number got, uh, as the stability number gets low, then you've got a wall that's close to failure and you're, and you're going to get your, your soil behind it's going to be in a higher plastic state so that you're going to have, uh, I'm sorry, as your stability number goes up, let's see, yes. Um, the the soil is going to be closer to a state of failure and so you're going to get higher loads. So it makes sense that um, we, when we ta start talking about clays that we look at the stability number. And again, we're going to use the same formulation as stability number, where the stability number is um, gamma h divided by SU, except now we're going to average SU over the entire height of the soil to a depth of v over the square root of 2. Um, remember when we were doing the basal stability, we said we only gonna, we're only going to um, estimate it near the base. But now for these numbers, we want to estimate it over the whole height of the wall. So this is really important that when you're doing the, the stability numbers for, for uh, excavation support, for, for worrying about strut loads, that what you, what you look at is the, the stability number for the entire wall, not just the base. Remember, when we were looking at the basal stability, we just looked at the base, right? Okay. <clears throat> 
So we want to average it over the whole height of the wall. So for soft, for medium clays, right, we're going to have high stability numbers um, for the ends that are greater than five or six. In this case, it, when, we, when we get end values that is high, this high, the, the, uh, the clay behind the wall should be in a, play, uh, a state of plastic failure. Uh, so the, in that case, the earth pressures on, on a wall should be close to the limit equilibrium earth pressures. So for stiff clays, where n is less than 4, um, theoretically in these cases, the, the soil is strong enough to stand up without any excavation support, which is probably not a good idea. But theoretically, you don't need any load in the wall, so all the load, all the load you put in the wall is just going to be a function of how much you jacked the struts into the wall. Because there's no, the, theoretically, the, the, the excavation can hold itself open without you there. Uh, again, for safety and for safety purposes, and uh, you know that's probably not a good way to do it because all has one thing go wrong and there's nothing there to support the wall, you could have a big problem. Um, so obviously, that's not a, it's not a good way to design, but that's what the theory tells us, right? Okay, so. Um, Let's talk about the soft for medium clays now for when we have large stability numbers. So if you remember for fee equals zero conditions, um, our active earth pressure is uh, going to be, uh, we're going to have one is that, right, it's going to be one minus sine phi over one plus sine phi, you know, it's just going to be one uh, for, for the uh, uh, friction term minus uh, 4SU over gamma H. That's going to be our active earth uh, pressure coefficient. Or we can just write that as um, 1 over, if, if we have an N of 4, we can just write it uh, uh, 1 times 4 over N. Because write SU over gamma H, this is, this is N, right? SU over gamma H. So if we look at data um, for soft, uh, uh, cuts in soft clays, and this comes from Chicago, Japan, England, and Norway. Uh, again, these are uh, um, Olson's computations. So in this case, uh, he has his, the calculated uh, earth pressure against the measured earth pressure. And these are assuming phi equals zero conditions. Interesting, uh, there's some interesting stuff here. I'll give you a minute to look at this. What's the most interesting thing by space, by location? Norway's really freaking low or high? High. The strut loads in Norway are really, really high. If we ignore, ignore the, the Norway loads, we'll come back and talk about this in a minute. If we, if we ignore all these Norway loads, right? So ignore all that stuff. Then we're getting strut loads that are um, uh, probably on average less than what we calculated active, but, uh, but reaching active and getting slightly above active. So, this, so if we ignore the Norway ones for a minute, we'd say, well, if we design for the active, that looks like it's a pretty good answer, ignoring the Norway strut loads, right? Do, you, do everybody see that and understand what I'm talking about? Yeah? OK. Well, what's going on with Norway? Um, well, um, so here's data. Uh, this is, again, from, from Peck's paper. This, the, these are the data from Chicago. Uh, again, and we're, this is, again, uh, zero is, uh, one is equal to the active earth pressure. And so when you see, uh, when you, on this plot, when you see two different earth pressure diagrams, those are for different depths of the excavation. So this is, the um, solid line was when the excavation was at a depth of 35 feet, and the dashed line was when it was at 42 feet. So that's why you're seeing these different uh, ones. And then uh, the, the uh, um, this one says S9C and this says S8A, so those are different struts at different locations along the length of the excavation. So again, these are different measurements in different places. And you'll notice that we get as high as 1 here, maybe just slightly above 1, but for the most part, we're below 1, except here in this section, we get a little above 1. Uh, these are the cuts in Japan. 
these three. Um, and, and very few uh, measurements greater than one, but there's just a few here that are getting greater than one. Uh, this is the one cut in England at Shellhaven. Uh, again, depending on, um, oh, these are two, I'm sorry, these are two different, um, two different locations, two different projects in England, one's at Shellhaven and one's at Pool Power. Um, but again, notice we get a few measurements uh, that are greater than one. And notice the, greater, the measurements of greater one are almost always near the base of these. And then, here's Norway. Well, um, the difference in the Norway, um, um, the difference in the cuts in Norway is the Norway cuts were in deep, uh, soft clay uh, deposits where the base of the foundation was in soft clay. So there were, there were deep uh, soft clay deposits. The excavation only went down at some, some distance. And below the excavation, soft clay continued for, some, some, for, for a, uh, quite a bit of depth, more than, more than uh, square root of two times B. And all the other ones, the excavations went down into a stiff material. There was soft clay behind the excavations, but the excavations went to a stiff material. So, and you, you remember the, the data we looked on basal heave, and, and, and we noticed that there was, a, there was a lot of displacement below the bottom of the excavation, right? That a lot of the lateral displacement occurs from, ex, from, from displacement below the bottom of the excavation. So it, should, so it should make sense then that if you've got a lot of soft clay below the bottom of the excavation, you're going to have more movement down there. If you've got more movement down there, you're going to get higher strut loads. So the approach that was taken was to put this little modification factor in here, m, into calculating this, this uh, and we shouldn't even call this the active earth pressure coefficient, but that's what we call it. It's really just a weighting factor, and I'll, and I'll discuss that later. But when we're, when we're back calculating Ka, we're going to put this little fudge factor in there. And if we're, if we're doing excavations down, uh, that go down to a medium or a firm base, in other words, a base that's much stiffer than the soft clays that we're excavating through, M will be equal to 1, and that's the way we calculated all of these earth pressures, right? We just calculated them as 4 times SU over gamma H, with, M was implicitly equal to 1. You with me? Yeah? Okay. And then, if we multiply the uh, Norway um, excavations by 0 0.4 here, we get this earth pressure diagram, apparent earth pressure diagram. And now things look a lot more like the rest of them, where the peak, the, the, the peak strut loads are giving you apparent earth pressures that are pretty close to active earth pressure. A little higher, in fact, maybe even uh, in some cases it's significantly higher than the other ones, but at least we're back in the ballpark. So the approach that was taken and recommended by Peck is that if you're in uh, excavations that have a deep soft base, in other words, you're, you're going into soft clay, but you're not getting it, you're not, you're, your uh, excavation support isn't extending into a stiff layer, then you're going to get higher strut loads, and this is how we account for that. So the recommendation then uh, for uh, Tutsagi and Peck the recommendation uh, for um, apparent earth pressure envelopes for soft clays, where n is greater than 5 to 6, is that you use the full um, earth pressure, the, the full active earth pressure, um, and it does taper off at the surface. Uh, down At the top quarter, you can taper it down to zero. And Olson has plotted um, all the data. Um, this is with, uh, this, is, this is adjusting the Norway data. In this case, the Norway data are these um, round circles here. So there's still some outliers in the Norway data if you do this. But notice that most of the Norway data is contained within the earth pressure envelope. This is a really good picture to discuss why we call these envelopes, right? What we're trying to do is find some loads, you know, an envelope that contains most of the, of the loads that you're going to see in your struts.
So I'll leave it to you to decide how good that earth pressure envelope is. So don't forget when you're doing this, you've got, a, you've got this M factor in here that you need to, M is 0 0.4 for cuts underlain by deep soft material and otherwise M is equal to 1. You leave that off and you're in a soft material with a soft base, you could have a very unpleasant surprise. Uh, for reference, uh, Chebotaryov's recommendation in for clays from 1951, I plotted plotted here uh, from this point uh, to this point to this point. He recommends again. Um, you know, Chebi Chebotaryov was a little more theoretical about this. He says, "Well, these got to be increasing with depth because it's that's what the earth pressure gives us." So this is what his earth pressure envelope gives it. It's clearly. Um, in this case, less conservative than the Tertsagi and Peck envelope. Um, but I also don't think he looked at any, um, I don't, I'm not sure in his, I don't think he had any of the, uh, may not have had any of the excavations where there was, where they were done over soft material. Um, well, so what do we do in cases where we have stiff clays, where, where N is less than four? Because in, in that case, we said, well, we don't need any, um, we don't, tech, tech, you know, theoretically don't need any excavation support. Um, to be consistent, um, Peck recommended um, um, a, a, a method similar to the to the to the soft clay me method. Um, and so this is this is the zero point. Uh, um, 0.2 times H, and this is 0.4. Remember, that's what we got with sands. If you remember, for the sands, oops, that's not the right one. Here it is. Um, no, where's 0.2? I can't remember where that where that is. Hmm. Anyway, the uh, sorry, I can't remember where the I was going to compare it to the 0 0.2. So this is based on uh, th th these are completely empirical and based on very limited data. Um, oh, um, and uh, recommending that um, the earth pressure diagram go from um, zero point it, 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 at the top and the bottom for the first quarter it tapers off and ends up here at uh, 0.4 H and that the lower envelope is at 0.2 gamma H. Uh, and for reference, there's Chebotaryov's um, diagram. Uh, and there, there you go, there, those are the data. All right, you can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, we got six points. Uh, so what do we do for other cases? Well, um, uh, wh what do we do when N is uh, not stiff, so it's not less than four, but it's not up here in a really soft, and we got these medium clays? Well, you probably should be using the worst of the two, uh, the two clay envelopes. Uh, if you have clay sands and sandy clays, um, then you can use the um, you can use the sand envelope, but you've got to calculate a Ka that's a fun, you, you now need to calculate a Ka that includes both the frictional and the cohesive part of the earth pressure diagram. And this, this, is, not, this is not Ka, this is just a weighting factor. So what you're going to do is you're going to take 4SU over gamma H and weight that by the, the theoretical active earth pressure. Remember, our other one was just one minus four SU over gamma H, and then you're going to uh, you're going to weight that again on the outside. Um, so that's just a way to get an apparent um, undrained parameter, really, for that. Um, so that's th those are the two approaches to use um, um, the, the approach to use when you're in between. So I think I'm pretty sure here. Yeah, let's just finish this, and we'll take a break just a little late. So, so I think this is the most important part of the presentation because
Um, using the earth pressure diagrams is pretty simple. They just these trapezoidal shaped things is really, really pretty simple. So this is what I think is the most important part. Um, so when we put our bracing in, um, the walls are stable and the soil is not at a, a, at a limit state. Right? And except in the case for the very soft clays where, where, where we are going to get to a limit state. So the soil is not in a state of failure in these cases. It's not at the active pressure and it's not at the, it's not at the passive pressure. So when we compare these apparent earth pressures to uh, some limit, that's just, that's an arbitrary limit. Right, we picked Ka to compare these things to. These things are not getting to Ka, with the, again, with the exception of the soft clay. So this is just, we're just comparing, we're, we're just trying to normalize the earth pressures we measured in all these different, uh, these different um, um, excavations to some number so that we can use them again someplace else where, where it's not exactly the same material, not exactly the same depth. So we're picking some number to normalize the data to so we have a non-dimensional number. And we're using Ka, and that's just some arbitrary value that we're, we're normalizing to. So that's the first thing to understand. Um, the second thing to understand is these are based on very limited data. And particularly for those stiff clays, now fortunately those are the ones that are the least issue, but these are based on very limited data. And these are still the, earth, the apparent earth pressure diagrams that are published and used in all, almost all design texts. So, and these data come from 1940s and 50s. Um, when we get to the clay soils, these assumptions of undrained conditions are, are pretty questionable. Most of these excavations st stayed open for months. Uh, there's clearly going to be some drainage in that time, so um, they clearly weren't completely undrained. Um, and, and most importantly, what we have here are envelopes of earth pressures that give us estimates of the tieback or the brace loads that we saw. When we actually go to tiebacks, we're going to use different, uh, with different earth pressure envelopes. We'll talk about that when we get to tiebacks. But remember, these were derived from measuring strut loads, and then we calculated earth pressure diagrams. Now, we're going to keep them as earth pressure diagrams because that allows us to apply them to any different uh, location of struts within a, an excavation. But ultimately, what we're doing is uh, we're finding ways that we can estimate strut loads. Don't ever forget that. That's what we're doing with these. We're finding ways that we can estimate strut loads. Don't assume this has anything whatsoever to do with the distribution of stress behind the wall. It's just a way to estimate strut loads. Um, so it's suitable for designing the strut or the bracing. What it's not suitable for is calculating the actual loads and in particular calculating any displacements. There's nothing in this uh, process that should give you any, uh, it should never be used to calculate displacements. What they should give you are loads that you can use to design your struts. And uh, just to make it really clear, I love these comments from, that are in Tersagi and Peck. I'll, I'll let you read these. I've even been so bold as to bold some of these. Okay, so the first comment is tells you the you know the whenever you're using it whenever you're using anything empirical one of the first one of the most important things you should know about any empirical method you're doing is what's the playing field on which the empirical data came from All right if the empirical data came from a baseball field using them in a cricket field is probably not going to work for you All right you've got to know the environment from which they came so these and they say it very clearly here 
right? So these are for excavations, uh, you know, they're, they're as deep as 40 feet. So these aren't for very deep excavations. I like when I read this, because when I read this, I, I Peck actually was, when I was a student at Illinois, he was an emeritus professor. He used to come back like once a semester to give some kind of guest lecture. And I actually met, he was retired in Albuquerque and my first job in, uh, was in Albuquerque. And I actually met him there. I got to eat, go to his house and eat dinner and all this kind of stuff. And so when I, and, and when I read this stuff, I could just hear him saying it. Because it's, you know, I, I'm pretty sure he wrote these sentences. Uh, in fact, I could bet he wrote most of the sentences in that book and, and, uh, and uh, Tsutsagi wrote very few of them. Uh, so I can just hear him saying, particularly that second one, these earth pressure diagrams have nothing to do with the real earth pressure. That's not what they're for. These are not for predicting the earth pressure behind the wall. These are used for calculating loads that you can use to design struts. They're not even going to tell you what the strut loads are. But they're going to give you loads that you can use to design the struts so they won't fail. And if, you put, and if you install them in generally the way that these excavations were installed, you should get displacements similar to those empirical displacements uh, estimates that we looked at last time. That's all these are. They have a limited value. They're really valuable, but their value is limited. They're much better than nothing. And we, we, we're using these all the time to still, for, for typical, for, for typical low-risk uh, excavation support, we do this all the time. And it still works. I would, I would, I would venture to guess that in, in, unless there's something really, really valuable behind the wall where you've got to really get some displacements and you're worried about stuff, uh, you know, for, for uh, um, um, construction excavations that uh, it's particularly ones that the, that the uh, um, contractors uh, has to design. This is the way you're going to do it. Okay, let's talk a little bit of how we do computations. It's, it's, it's pre pretty simple, but there's one little nuance that you need to understand is that um, realize that those earth pressure diagrams are all function of, gam of, of the height of the construction, right? The depth, the H, the depth of the of the cut, and the depth of the cut changes over the life of the cut, right? I mean, you, you know, you start at one depth, you're gonna have a certain earth pressure envelope, and you're gonna go deeper, you're gonna have a new earth pressure envelope. So when you do the computations, um, the very first thing you can do is check basal stability, because if you got a basal stability problem, you, you don't care about strut loads, because <laughs> the whole excavation is gonna come in the base. So the first thing you wanna do is check basal stability. If you don't have adequate basal stability, then you gotta go deeper, uh, or you've got to use a stiffer wall. We talked about that last time. Um, and then determine which of these earth pressure uh, envelope, apparent earth pressure envelopes, uh, is going to govern to based on N and the and the soil and the soil type. So if it's a sand soil, you're going to use the sand one. But if it's a if it's a, if it's a fee equals zero clay condition, then you've got to calculate the N values and figure out which one uh, which one of the earth pressure diagrams corresponds. Um, then you've got to know where the struts are going because you can't calculate the strut loads unless you already know where they're going. So you're going to estimate where you think the struts are going based on, uh, you, you could do a full height, a quick full height back of the envelope calculation and, think, and figure out where you think the struts are going to go. Where the struts are going to go is dependent on what they're, what's going on inside the excavation. You, you're going to get some required strut spacings that uh, people are going to, in particular, if there's a lot of work at the bottom of the excavation, they're going to tell you, hey, that last strut's got to be at least 12 feet off the bottom of the excavation or we can't do the things we need to do. So there's a lot of things that are going to go into, into strut spacing, but that's something that you're going to need to know. Um, and then, once you've got your strut spacing in there, you think you know what it is, you need to calculate the strut loads for every, um, every stage of excavation. It, it's, it, it's not apparent, it, it's not necessarily the case that the last excavation height is going to give you the highest loads. Depending on, on, on the soil conditions, they, the highest loads may come at another time. So the way you do this is you, you uh, you already know where your struts are placed, and you do your excavation down to your first level excavation, then and then you draw your earth your apparent earth pressure diagram. So if I've got a if I if I've got a um, 
uh, a stiff soil, I'm going to have this uh, bilinear excavation. Uh, if I got a clay soil, I'm going to have this bilinear excavation uh, apparent earth pressure diagram. I'm going to put my strut in there. I'm going to calculate some strut load for that. Okay, now I'm going to go down to here. Now I've got this earth pressure envelope. And this strut load is now based on the tributary, this condition right here. I got another strut that's going in, but it's not there right now. Right? That strut's not there right now. And so right now, this apparent earth pressure diagram is Ha you, you, you're assuming that you, you essentially assuming you got a strut here, so the, the, the envelope for the, the, I'm sorry, the tributary area for this uh, strut load right now is that. So you've got, this strut has to take all this load right in here right now. Then you're going to put your, and, and so it's, it's going to have a higher strut load than it did before, right? Then you're going to put in your next strut. Well, your next strut's not going to be at the bottom, it's going to be some distance above the bottom. So now the tributary, and now you're going to calculate your strut loads again. Well, the tributary area for the top strut now is actually higher than it was before. And so theoretically, it's going to have a lower strut load. So when you're calculating the strut loads, make sure you understand the construction sequence and you're calculating the strut loads for every sequence. You can't just calculate the loads for the end condition because the worst case condition is probably going to be something other than the final condition. because you're always excavating down below your last strut and then putting your last strut in. Now for the lower struts that may not be the case. And then you're going to go down lower. Now we're going to have a new earth pressure diagram, right? We're going to have a new earth pressure diagram for this one. Again, now the, now the tributary area for the second strut goes from there to there. You're going to have some strut load, right? This is the, the tributary area for the second strut is going to go halfway between the first, I'm sorry, halfway between the first strut. I did, did that wrong. I'm glad somebody gave me a grimace right there. The tributary area for the second strut now is going to go halfway between there and there, and halfway between here and here. And you can put your third strut in, and now that this tributary area for the second strut is actually going to move up some. It's now going to, now in this case, now that's going to move up to here. You know, and this is assuming these struts actually go in right near the base. If they actually excavate quite a bit below there, it's going to be an even bigger difference. So you've got to know the construction sequence. And finally, you're going to go to the last one. You're going to have a new earth pressure diagram. Um, and and you, so make sure you know the sequence. For instance, th there's a big difference in the load you're going to get in the second strut if you, place the, if you place the third strut here than if you place the third strut after you excavate all the way down. Big difference. And, and the contractor's not going to want to do this one. They're going to want to excavate all the way down here and then put the strut in. So you, it's really, really important that, that you know the construction sequence or you can't calculate the loads correctly. And then, now that you know the loads, now you can design your bracing system. Um, and you'll often, you design your bracing system, you might end up having come back here and you might have a new, you know, you might design your bracing system and say, hey, this isn't going to work. I've got to put more struts in or I've got to put this strut in sooner. And you're going to go back. It's an iterative process like, like any design process. All right. Cool. So what I'd like to do now is take a break. And then when we come back, I'd like you to gather up in groups and take a look at that um, design problem. Uh, it's not going to be nearly as simple as everything we just talked about. Um, but I'd like you to get in your groups and start working on the earth. Just, just worry about the apparent earth pressure diagram and see what to do. Um, so it, it, it'll stymie you immediately almost. At least I hope it will. Uh, so let's take a break.